Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the director of the Southern Fire Exchange program with the University of Florida. I'm hosting the webinar today from Tall Timbers Research Station north of Tallahassee. Today we have a suite of expert speakers from around the southeast that will be covering a wide range of topics related to understanding and managing smoke and air quality. So if you're a prescribed fire practitioner or working in the smoke and air quality region, uh, I think this presentation should be well worth your time and we're glad you're here. I'd like to take just a quick moment to share a little bit of information about the Southern Fire Exchange. SFE is a regional program for fire science delivery in the Southeast. We are a collaborative among the University of Florida, Tall Timbers Research Station, North Carolina State University, and the US Forest Service Southern Research Station. We are sponsored by the federally funded Joint Fire Science Program and we are the Southeastern branch of the Nationwide Fire Science Exchange Network. Working together with our network of partners, we deliver programs, opportunities, and events that bridge the divide between the fire science and natural resource management communities. Throughout the South, we host workshops, we coordinate webinars like this one, we develop fact sheets and create other content and activities that move science into the hands of managers, while also working to connect researchers with the pressing and relevant fire science needs of the natural resource management community. We have a whole series of prescribed fire related webinars scheduled for the next few months. You can see them on the screen now. So be sure to look for emails or updates on our website and the social media pages uh, as registration opportunities open up for those webinars. And finally, if you're joining us today from an area outside of the Southeastern US, please look into connecting with your local fire science exchange network. These are the folks that are working to connect regional managers and researchers to address local fire science issues and make differences on the ground. You can visit firescience.gov uh, to find a map that you can click on to connect with the exchange in your region. So at this point, it is now my pleasure to hand over the presentation to Mr. Scott Davis from EPA Region 4 in Atlanta, and he'll be introducing our panel today. Okay. Well, as uh, David said, I'm Scott Davis with EPA's Southeast Regional Office in Atlanta. I'm chief of our air planning and implementation branch. Do you want to welcome everybody on today? We uh, look forward to presenting information for you and hopefully uh, being able to answer some of your questions at the end. Um, we did have a uh, Air Quality 101 webinar previously in May of 2018. So uh, our group uh, decided that it was a good time to have another one. And we do want to thank the Southern Fire Exchange for hosting today's uh, particular um, webinar. But we're, uh, our particular group is the uh, Southeast Prescribed Fire and Air Quality Work Group. And this group was formed back in uh, 2013. Uh, we had a Prescribed Fire and Smoke Management Summit down in Itchway, Georgia at the uh, Joseph Jones Ecological Research Center. And our particular group involves the eight southeastern states. Uh, we brought all the state air directors and the state forestry and fire chiefs together along with some other regional partners um, initially. And we've continued since uh, 2013. Uh, we do have an excellent uh, work group planning team that uh, helps to get everything going uh, as we continue to progress with our work in the Southeast. Um, our work group planning team, uh, we do have, uh, just to let, those, let you know who that is, we have uh, Mark Melvin from the Jones Research Center down in Itchaway. We have Mike Zupko from the Wildland Fire Leadership Council, uh, Jen Fawcett from North Carolina State University Extension Office, and then from EPA Region 4, we have myself and Rick Gillum. And our Southeast Prescribed Fire and Air Quality Work Group, um, we've used it as a forum to exchange um, state, regional, and national prescribed fire and smoke management, management air quality goals and issues. And we've been able to, through our group, identify regional prescribed fire and air quality coordination needs and solutions. And we do get together every quarter for conference calls. And then every two years, we have uh, three-day smoke summits. 
And as I said, those started in uh, 2013, and we've had one in uh, 2015, 2017, and the most recent one was last year, 2019. As David mentioned, we have an excellent uh, group of speakers today. Uh, we have gathered um, over 110 years of experience and expertise for you today from across the Southeast. Uh, we're going to be starting out with Rick Gillum from our EPA office in Atlanta. And Rick is a national air quality modeling expert. And uh, then we'll have, that, we'll have uh, Heidi Lassane from our EPA Region 4 office as well. Heidi is our indoor air quality program manager. And then we'll have Jim Boylan from the Georgia Air Protection Branch. And Jim is manager of the planning and support program. Then we'll have Randy Strait from the North Carolina Division of Air Quality. And Randy is chief of the planning section. And then Jen Fawcett will wrap it up. She's from North Carolina State University Extension. And she's an extension associate. And then she also is our work group coordinator for our surpass prescribed fire work group, and you'll hear more, out, more about that later on in the presentation. So I will now turn it over to Rick Gillum from EPA. All right, so uh, what we wanted to start out with is um, a discussion about um, what the what of, of prescribed fire, smoke, and air quality and its relationship to air quality. But before we get into that, um, I wanted to just briefly show this slide just to give some context. And I know a lot of the prescribed fire folks out there may have seen this map before, but this is a map from the, um, generated by the National Association of State Foresters and the Coalition of Prescribed Fire Councils. And it shows, gives you perspective on the amount of prescribed fire that's done across the country. And you can see here in the Southeast, um, we by far do uh, the majority of the prescribed burning in the country and the Midwest is, is a close second. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, to give everybody that perspective and see that um, Georgia and Florida do over a million acres each and Florida actually does over 2 million acres of prescribed burning. So um, this next slide, um, I put this in here to just to show folks that um, the different intensities of wildland fire smoke um, and uh, obviously you can get anywhere from a small amount shown there in, in picture B all the way up to huge amounts uh, generated by C and D, which would be uncontrolled catastrophic wildfires. And obviously we would prefer to have um, a scenario like B, where we have a much less controlled um, smoke. So um, now I wanna get into what what the relationship is between fire, smoke, and air quality. And um, as you could imagine, smoke can, contains a significant amount of air pollutants. And uh, this slide lists a, a number of the primary ones. Particulate matter is the, the major pollutant of concern. And we'll talk about that more later. And, and Heidi will talk to us about the health effects of PM. Um, but ozone precursors, ozone is a respiratory irritant pollutant and uh, it's not actually emitted from fires, but it's formed in the atmosphere. And I'll talk about that on, uh, in a couple slides. Uh, carbon monoxide is a very noxious gas that most folks know is um, dangerous to human health. Uh, the good thing about that is it's, um, it dissipates rapidly in the environment. Carbon dioxide is also important as a greenhouse gas and then other hazardous air pollutants that I'll talk about also. Uh, as you can see the, um, on the slide that 90% of smoke particles are particulate matter uh, with uh, a size fraction of uh, less than 10 microns and about 90% of that is actually PM 2.5 we call it which is the fine particulate matter which is the most toxic and like I said Heidi's going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, 
this this graph here shows that um, prescribed fire smoke uh, is, or the, the concentration of particulate matter in prescribed fire smoke typically from what research has shown is much less than what's in wildfire smoke. I mean, that's kind of intuitive, but um, there has been a little bit of research done that that's showing that and there needs to be more research, but um, I think it's important for folks to recognize that to um, uh, understand. So uh, as I mentioned, ozone is, a, is another pollutant that we're concerned about. It's one of our national um, air pollutants of concern. And um, this, this slide shows that it's actually formed in the atmosphere from what we call precursors, which are volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides. And fires and smoke contain both of these VOCs and NOx. And uh, once they're uh, in the atmosphere in the presence of sunlight, they can react and form ozone. Um, that that is a complex reaction. It can go back and forth, um, and meaning that um, fire can actually, in some cases, if you get enough smoke, it can block out the sunlight and it actually can inhibit ozone production. Uh, so there's uh, an, quite a bit of research going on in that realm, but um, there have been instances where um, higher ozone concentrations have been found related to fires. And I think Jim is gonna talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, carbon monoxide is another pollutant, like I mentioned. Uh, the good thing about that for the general public is it's definitely um, rare to see high concentrations of that due to fires. However, for firefighters, that would be of potential concern if they're right in close to where the fire is actually happening. And then other toxic compounds like uh, formaldehyde and chrolion are um, things that are found in much smaller, smaller concentrations, but they're much more toxic. And so they can be of potential concern as well. Uh, this, these graphs show um, in very simple terms, the transport of smoke emissions and, and how that's important that uh, fires uh, typically are not, uh, wildland fires obviously are not happening in urban areas or cities, but the smoke uh, from the fires can be transported to the cities where the majority of people live. And uh, they can combine with the other emissions from other sources like industries, mobile sources, cars, trucks, um, agriculture, and all of those things. So all, all of it combined together is what people are actually exposed to. And so that's, that's of concern. And one thing to note is that um, the emissions from these, some of these other sources are, are continuing to decrease due to um, EPA and state air quality folks um, regulations and actions. And so the percent that is attributable to fire smoke is actually potentially increasing. So just keep that in mind. And then the, the graph on the right shows uh, transport of smoke um, to potentially longer distances. And then you could have impacts on like visibility in, um, in like national parks and things like that. So those are important things to consider as well. Um, I wanted to put a plug in for this document here. This is a, a great overview document. It's the National Wildfire Coordinating Group developed this document. There was an older version, uh, but it was recently updated in 2018. And if you wanna get a good feel for all of these different um, topics related to smoke management, air quality, um, and even the fire behavior and all of that is discussed in this document. So I will hand it over to Heidi now and she's gonna to talk to us about some of the health impacts. All right, so fires can expose populations to a number of environmental health hazards like smoke and byproducts of com combustions of wood and other chemicals that can be released from burning structures. Particulate matter exposures is the principal pu public health threat from short-term exposures to wildfire smoke. Um, next slide, Rick. 
So what is PM 2.5? Um, so EPA, we monitor the um, concentration of different pollutants in the air that pose health risk or negative environmental effects. Pollutant um, in the air, um, our concentration that is the, the limits that are unhealthy for some of our, um, some or all of the population. So among these pollutants are particulate matter, which are tiny solid and liquid particles that are suspended in the air. These small particles pose a health risk because they can be inhaled passing the throat and entering the lungs. The most hazardous uh, particulates are those that are classified as fine particulates, which are smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter or about 30 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And to really look at that, let's go to the next slide. These microscopic particles known as PM 2.5 are so tiny that they can travel deep into the lungs causing short-term health problems and aggravating long-term respiratory disorders. Next slide. Exposure to the particle pollution is a public health hazard. So when inhaled, the particle pollution can travel deep into the lungs and can cause or aggravate heart and lung diseases. Exposure to particle pollution can cause increases in doctor and emergency visits, hospital emissions, use of prescription medication, and absences from school and work. So the populations we're um, really looking at are um, like sensitive to uh, particulate matter air pollution are like people with heart failure, coronary heart disease, um, folks with uh, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that's the COPD, and folks with asthma. So we'll use for today's um, talk, let's use asthma as an example. So next slide, please. Um, so asthma is a serious, sometimes life-threatening chronic respiratory disease that affects the quality of life for more than 24 million Americans, including an estimated 6 million children. Although there's no cure for asthma yet, asthma can be controlled through medical treatment and management for environmental triggers. Um, researchers have long linked asthma with exposure to, as to air pollution. Air pollution can make asthma symptoms worse and trigger asthma attacks. Next slide. So just looking at the pathology of asthma and how it is, if you can um, just think about the slide we did before and thinking about, about how um, the PM 2.5 can travel into our airways, um, poor air quality from pollution of asthma, um, how the allergens, they just worse, can worsen and can cause coughing and shortness of breath, decreased ability to breathe and deeply um, aggravation of existing lung conditions. So some of the actions that you may be able to take is um, to monitor the PM level during um, prescribed burns, try to reduce the amount of time spent outdoors during the fires, um, do not smoke, reduce particle sources like wood burning stoves, um, burning candles and uh, burning fireplaces, and also explore air filters that can help reduce um, indoor PM. And last slide. Next slide. Yeah, here are a couple of our resources we have at EPA that um, to help with reducing PM during fires. Um, we have a couple of more, but here are a couple of that that may be able to help you um, during that time. And I'm short and sweet.
you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I have my information in that beginning slide. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks, Heidi. Um, yeah, we'll move on to uh, some additional discussion about um, now kind of changing gears a little bit into what we call the why. I, um, which is why do we care about smoke and um, its impacts on air quality and I think we need to have a, a some understanding of the regulations and guidance and policies that EPA has uh, and then those actually are implemented in most cases by our state counterparts um, but um, to, just to give you kind of a, a background um, the uh, there are no actual federal regulations that require um, emission controls on prescribed burning, um, but there are a number of regulations that do talk about smoke from both prescribed fire and wildfire, and I'll talk about those here. Uh, and just to give you the, the background though, the overall background, um, those pollutants that we talked about earlier, the, the two that are kind of main concern from smoke and um, fire is particulate matter and ozone. And so I've listed here the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. These are in uh, federal regulations and then also our state counterparts have adopted them. And so for PM10, which is the size fraction of the 10 micro, microns or smaller part, particles, the standard is 150 microgram per cubic meter on a 24-hour average. For PM2.5, there are actually two standards, a 35 microgram per cubic meter standard on a daily average, and then a 12 microgram per cubic meter value on an annual average, so averaged across the entire year year. And then for ozone, the current standard is 70 parts per billion on an eight hour average. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a few minutes. Um, but there's some other regulations. Um, this exceptional events rule, I will talk about that. Um, regional haze regulations uh, that uh, deal with visibility impacts and um, a, a pretty dated policy that's out there now, but it's still it's still in effect. Uh, it was developed in 1998. It's called the Interim Air Quality Policy on Wildland and Prescribed Fires. So we'll cover all of those things briefly here. Um, before I get into that, I just wanted to highlight this slide that EPA recognizes the importance of prescribed fire. And this was a quote from uh, one of our regulatory actions on the exceptional events rule, where we highlight that um, we recognize the importance of prescribed fire and its use for maintaining fire adapt adapted ecosystems and also for reducing um, public um, risk and safety from uncontrolled catastrophic wildfires. So um, that is something that um, the, the agency has gone on record to support the use of prescribed fire. So this map here shows um, nationally the uh, areas in the country that are not meeting the PM standards. We call those non-attainment areas. Um, the, uh, the big map here shows the 2012, um, the most recent PM 2.5 standard, that annual 12 microgram per cubic meter. And of note here, uh, on all three of these maps, actually, for the southeast, um, there are no areas that are not meeting the um, the PM standards. So um, things are growing great and, and kind of thinking back to that slide I showed earlier about all the prescribed fire that's done here in the southeast that um, something must be working well. <laughs> so um, I think uh, there's a lot there's a lot that goes into that but um, it's, it's good that we can do all this fire and still not have um, violations of the standards. Um, along with that, EPA 
collects um, what we call the, we generate the national emissions inventory. We were collect emissions information from all different types of source categories and we do that every three years. The, um, the 2017 version is just about to be released. Um, it takes a while to compile all that information so the da data that's being shown here is from the 2014 NEI and just of note the, t the top uh, emission category for PM 2.5 overall um, is fires. And that is a combination of both wildfires and prescribed fires. Um, um, but um, it, it's important, it is definitely an important source of particulate matter in, in the US. And the map on the right just shows a, a density that's kind of similar to um, that original map I showed that of all of the areas of the country that have significant amounts of fire. Um, this is another map that shows specifically prescribed fire emissions of PM 2.5, the best information that we had available uh, for the 2014 NEI. And uh, again, you can see there are uh, definitely some hotter spots where a lot of prescribed fire happens. Um, the good thing again is that in relation to the urban areas, there are not, uh, we don't have any PM 2.5 non-attainment areas. The Atlanta area is an ozone non-attainment area and there's a couple up in Northern Kentucky as well. Uh, but um, um, that, that as far as, um, as far as we know that fires are not significant contributors uh, generally for ozone uh, for the Atlanta non-attainment area, but Jim's going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then this, this map here shows the national uh, non-attainment areas for ozone. And uh, you can see uh, again that we have very few in the southeast. Um, California is definitely a, uh, its own its own area and that's definitely, they've got a lot of issues with both wildfire and poor air quality in California. And uh, we'd have to get some of our Western counterparts on to explain a lot of the, the details there. But again, um, this chart, these charts show the emissions of the ozone precursors, the, the volatile organic compounds and the NOx. And you, again, you can see that fires are um, significant sources of both of these, less so for NOx than VOCs. Um, but in general, fires do contribute significantly to um, these emissions. And I wanted to put this, um, this slide in here as um, a plug for one of our um, websites that EP ha EPA has, and it's a trends website, and it's it's very it's interactive. It, um, you can go to this site and and get a you can um, click around and see the, the um, reductions in em emissions from different categories that have occurred over time, and there is a, a page on fire as well. So I would encourage you to go there um, and look into that. Um, Moving on to the exceptional events rule. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on it, but essentially um, what it does is it provides a way for um, uh, excluding air quality monitoring data from regulatory decisions if, um, if you can show that it was caused by an exceptional event. And the, the middle of the slide there shows how exceptional event is defined. Um, and uh, the important thing for us to understand is that prescribed fire, uh, and if it causes a um, increased value at an air quality monitoring site, it can be treated as an exceptional event. Uh, EPA put out a guidance um, just in August of last year that talks about all of the details of that. And uh, for, um, for the purposes of time, I won't go into that here, but um, I'd definitely be open to questions if folks have questions on that. Moving on to the regional haze regulations. Again, this is another uh, aspect of EPA's regulations that 
addresses fire and smoke. Um, the um, regional haze is important at um, like national parks and um, U.S. forest areas and, and things of that nature like the Great Smoky Mountains and those are actually identified in the Clean Air Act itself by Congress and we were directed to make sure visibility um, does not degrade in those areas and actually improves over time and so fire can contribute to regional haze along with emissions from industrial sources and all all different types of sources, but um, of importance here is um, the the latest revisions to the regional haze regulations talk about basic smoke management practices and smoke management programs um, in a similar way that the exceptional events rule that I talked about on the last slide does. And uh, we'll talk more about what's meant by those in a few minutes. Um, then I wanted to touch on that 1998 interim policy uh, that EPA developed working with other uh, agencies, state and federal agencies. And essentially what this, um, the idea behind this was to uh, figure out ways to allow uh, fire to function in its natural role um, of protecting healthy wildland ecosystems while also protecting human health and welfare by minimizing smoke emissions. So that was kind of the underpinnings and it's, um, it's got a lot of information on, on smoke management in this policy. Um, and so I'll move on to, in, in, as part of the policy, it, it kind of introduced this idea of smoke management programs in a more formalized way. And I'm not going to go through all of these items here, uh, but um, essentially the important parts of it are is to um, reduce risks to human health and safety and prevent deterioration of air quality uh, violations and protect the visibility in class one areas and the main thing the main way of doing that promoted by the the uh, program is using these um, smoke management procedures to minimize air emissions uh, and this slide shows that it, here in the southeast we have a number of states that embraced this interim policy alabama florida georgia and south carolina all have what we call um, state certified smoke management programs. They're more formalized. Uh, North Carolina and Mississippi also have smoke, ma smoke management programs. They haven't um, kind of followed the, the 98 policy, but they do have, uh, they are implemented by those states. So um, now I will hand it over to Jim Boylan and he's going to talk to us a little bit about exceptional events in Georgia. Hey, this is Jim Boylan. Hey Jim, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a case study and looking at the impacts of prescribed fires on air quality in Georgia by looking at some specific episodes. Um, so Rick already talked about the national ambient air quality standards, and he talked about we don't have any areas in the southeast violating the standards. Um, so I wanted to clarify some terms. So the, the first one is an exceedance of the NACs. So an exceedance of the NACs occurs when the 24-hour PM2.5 concentration is measured to be above 35 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, a violation of the NACs is when the um, you have the annual NACs or the 24-hour NACs. So for the annual NACs, it's the, the three-year average uh, greater than 12 micrograms per cubic meter. Or for the 24-hour standard, it's the 98th percentile of the 24-hour average values averaged over three years greater than 35. So the point of this slide is that you can actually have multiple exceedances of the NACs without actually having any violations of the NACs. Um, and that, in fact, that's what we see in Georgia, and actually we see that um, around the southeast, is there are measurements above 35, but when you look at the 98th percentile, which means you get to throw out the, high, the highest values, and then you average it over three years, um, that three-year average is below 35, and that's what we see here. Uh, but I'll be talking about these exceedances. 
Um, so on this slide, um, we perform a detailed analysis of every exceedance of the NACs in Georgia whenever it occurs. So today I will be discussing four PM 2.5 episodes in 2019, and they're, they're grouped together here. We have one in Atlanta, one in the, the Macon area, one in the Albany area, and one in Sandersville. So Atlanta, March 8, uh, 2019, um, exceedance. So the first thing we do is start out with some some nice graphics to understand the, uh, the PM 2.5 concentrations at all the monitors and create these isoplets. So on the left, we have March 7th. On the right, March 8th. March 8th was the um, exceedance. You can see the 39 micrograms per cubic meter at the Gwinnett monitor um, northeast of Atlanta. Um, in addition, we have actually mapped the Georgia Forestry Commission um, permits that were issued on those days and um, so those are the red triangles. And the bigger the triangle, uh, the more acres were permitted by the Georgia Forestry Commission. And what we can see here is on March 7th, there was a lot of fires in southwest Georgia. Um, and then on March 8th, we can see that there were some larger fires um, uh, just north of Macon. Um, so on this slide, we look at the time series. This helps us understand um, uh, basically the, for, the, the transport of the smoke plumes. And although the standard is 24 hour, our monitors actually can measure hourly PM 2.5 to help us understand uh, when we have the high values. And so what we can see here is that the exceedance, on, um, we actually start to see high values occurring um, at the monitor uh, shortly before midnight um, you know, right at the late night hours of March 7th, um, and then throughout the day on March 8th. Um, and so basically this is telling us that the exceedance on March 8th was actually caused by prescribed fires on March 7th. Um, in combination, you kind of see this, uh, this uh, double peak, uh, the concentrations go down and then they come back up, which we, we suspect might be caused by some more local fires um, on, uh, on March 8th. Um, and if we go back to this slide, we see um, the ones in uh, southwest Georgia are being transported up to Atlanta, and then the next day the fires north of Macon are being transported up to Atlanta. So that's why we think we see this double peak. Um, this slide shows the NOAA hazardous mapping system uh, graphics, which includes um, ozone concentrations, uh, wind barbs, satellite-derived fires, so the fires I showed before were from the, the permitted fires. These are actually derived from uh, satellite images. And then there's calculated pay, uh, smoke plumes that NOAA calculates and, and puts on here. And what we see is there's a lot of smoke um, on March 7th, um, especially in southwest Georgia. And those are the, that's the smoke that uh, was transported up into the Atlanta area overnight to cause an exceedance on, on March 8th. We don't see as much here we do see a couple of fires north of Macon, uh, but we don't show any smoke plumes. But part of the reason is, um, as we'll see on the next um, and two slides, is that there were some clouds covering up so that you don't really get a true picture of the satellite impacts when there's clouds. Um, this is just a um, high split uh, back trajectory at three different heights. We look at 500 meters, 1,000 meters, and 1,500 meters. And this is basically showing that the winds are blowing from the south or the southwest to the north or the northeast. So basically from the Albany area up to the Ad Atlanta area. And then we have satellite imagery. And here is a satellite image at 1.30 p.m. on March 7th um, showing the smoke plumes where you can actually see the, um, the, fi the satellite fires as well as with actual smoke plumes that were seen by the satellite. And that's at 1.30. And based on our back trajectories, we can actually follow these smoke plumes um, north and northeast into the Atlanta area, hitting the uh, Gwinnett monitor. On March 8th, um, we showed those large fires north of Macon. Um, however, there's clouds here, which makes it very hard uh, for the satellite to pick anything up when there's clouds um, and do the smoke plumes. But we, we suspect that the second uh, peak was, was caused by the fires north of Macon uh, being transported to the monitor as well. Um, 
So we've done similar analyses for the other three episodes. I'll go through those quickly. This is Macon and Warner Robbins on March 22nd, uh, 20th and 21st in 2019. So here we have two nearby monitors, um, uh, uh, 36 and 37 on March uh, 20th, and then a 50 and a 58 on March 21st. So two back-to-back -back days. Um, you can see the, per the uh, permits that were issued, the fire permits, um, that there were a number of permits issued on both days. However, when we look at the time series plot, what we can really get from this is it appears that the exceedances um, on both days were actually caused by fires that occurred on March 20th uh, because we don't get any high values on March 20th until later in the evening at both monitors. You can see it starts to crank up and actually goes over 150 micrograms per cubic meter, which when you do the 24-hour average um, was enough to make uh, March 20th go over the standard at both monitors. And then on March 21st, that plume lingered and uh, the monitor continued to read high, and then we got high va uh, values over the standard on March 21st. So um, we have two exceedance days caused basically by uh, um, fires on, on March 20th, impacting March 20th and March 21st. So here we can see the, uh, the HMS uh, smoke plumes, and we actually see the fires uh, north of Macon um, blowing downwards into Macon and Warner Robins, leading to high values. We don't see as many fires on March 21st or as much smoke plume. Um, and so that supports, uh, you know, that we, we think that exceedances on both days were caused by the fires on March 20th um, lingering around into the 21st. This slide shows the uh, wind trajectories, basically showing the wind coming from the north to the south on March 20th and then coming from the west to the east on March 21st. And here is satellite imagery uh, clear on March 20th showing the large smoke plumes and the, the fires. Um, you can see the smoke plumes, and based on the wind trajectories, those are the, that's the smoke plumes that were actually blown into Macon and Warner Robins. All right, uh, moving on to the third um, episode. This is Albany on March 22nd. So the uh, Macon ones were March uh, 20, um, 20th and 21st. This is March 22nd, but since it's a different location, we did we treat it as a separate episode. So here on March 21st, we, we can still see the uh, Macon and Warner Robins values, and then we have Albany down there at a lower value at 26, but then on March 22nd, we do see um, Albany at 38. So we actually looked at four days of time series here. We see that um, on March 21st, we almost had an exceedance, so we did not have an exceedance on March 21st. Um, initially, we thought we did, um, but then the data got certified, and that one actually dropped off. Um, our numbers after were certified changed a little. Uh, but what we do see is the exceedance on March 22nd, um, and this one looks like it's caused by uh, local fires because you start to get the peaks around um, 8 o'clock in the morning, um, you know, when the fires are, are kicking off, and, um, and they linger around the day. And then they decrease, and then we have a second peak um, later in the day, um, which actually led to an exceedance on March 22nd. It did not lead to an exceedance on March 23rd, though. These are the HMS plumes. Um, we can focus on the March 22nd, showing the large amount of fires um, north and northwest of Albany and the smoke plumes hitting directly on Albany. Um, we have our high split trajectory, showing the wind is coming from the north to the south. And then we have our satellite imagery, and we'll focus on the one on the right. March 22nd at 1.30 in the afternoon, you can actually see the fires, and you can actually see the smoke plumes blowing directly into the Albany area. And it looks like there's um, two sets of fires going on and that we might have two separate plumes um, hitting later on in the evening. And then finally, the Sandersville one. This one's the more recent one. This is one um, was just uh, last month in December, December 5th of 2019. So this was a pretty simple case in that um, this was truly just a one-day episode. Um, it was isolated. We had uh, a 39 at Sandersville, um, and you can see a number of uh, permits were issued by Georgia Forestry Commission. Um, the time series clearly shows a, a peak uh, later in the afternoon, um, which would indicate prescribed fires are being transported in, into the monitored area. We have our HMS smoke plumes. We actually have 
satellite imagery with uh, a lot of smoke plumes um, impacting the Sandersville monitor. Winds are coming from the north, um, north to the south. And then here we have satellite imagery again. Um, you know, luckily there was no clouds, so we could clearly see the smoke um, being transported directly to the Sandersville monitor at 1.30 that day. Um, so, in summary, um, prescribed fires contribute to PM2.5 exceedances, but, do, but have not caused any violations of the PM2.5 NACs in Georgia. Uh, prescribed fires can impact air quality on the day of the burn as well as the days following the burn. EPA may propose a new lower PM2.5 PM NACs in 2020, and that's under consideration as we speak. And um, good smoke management practices will become even more important to avoid future exceedances and violations of the PM NACs um, if the PM uh, NACs is lowered. And with that, I am finished, and I uh, will turn it over to um, the next speaker. Thank you, Jim. This is Randy Strait. Hey, Randy, we can hear you, and your slides look good. Go ahead. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to scoot along here because I think we're running behind. So I'm going to talk about the Air Quality Index. It's based off of the primary national ambient air quality standards for the five pollutants listed here, ground level ozone, fine PM, PM, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen di dioxide. Our state and local agencies, the focus <clears throat> today is on ozone and fine PM, and, and this is, those are the two pollutants for which state and local agencies prepare next day air quality for, forecast for. Uh, ozone standard is a seasonal thing. It um, runs from March 1 to October, the end of October, I believe for all the southeastern states except for Florida, which is year-round. So the forecast is only issued during the uh, ozone season for most of the southeastern states, but the PM25 24-hour forecast is issued for year-round. And I might note that uh, a state might have multiple or different areas for which they issue a forecast, and that forecast can vary from one area to the next within a state uh, due to um, either meteorological or emissions characteristics unique to that area. It's important to note the difference between the NACs and the AQI. The NACs is set by US EPA to protect the public health and is based on the averaging period, or, or they're based on an averaging period. They're pollutant specific in terms of the averaging period. And they're tracked, um, ambient air quality monitors are used to measure compliance with the NACs. The AQI, on the other hand, is used to communicate to individuals on a day-to-day -day basis the quality of, of ambient air and, and the potential health effects. And this is the AQI. It's uh, divided into six different air quality categories or levels, and it's color-coded to facilitate communication of the level of air quality to the public. And the left side of uh, the chart here indicates the health concern running from good, moderate, unhealthy, up to hazardous. And then the numeric, it's assigned a numer each category is assigned a numerical value and that on a scale from zero to 500. And those are all tied to the NACs. And then uh, there's a description of what the potential health uh, hazard are or concern would be associated with each category. And this slide is showing the um, air quality index breakpoints over here on the left that are associated with the various uh, levels of the NACs or the breakpoints in the NACs. So the important thing here is the value of 100 for an AQI identifies the value of the NACs. And so, for example, in the third column is eight-hour ozone standard in parts per million. So the standard is 0.070. It's assigned a value of 100 on the AQI. Anything over 100 would be um, exceeding the NACs. And the, just wanted to mention, uh, air quality forecasts are prepared by uh, the state and local agencies have meteorolo meteorologists on staff to prepare these forecasts. And they use uh, weather and um, air quality models to prepare the forecast uh, for the next day. And a lot of states do this for two or three days out. Um, and and what they're looking for in terms of uh, uh, preparing the forecast or weather patterns or trends associated with poor air quality or stagnant air. Um, and I just list a bunch of um, things that they're looking for here in terms of factoring into what the forecast should be for a given area. I'm not going to go through them here for time reasons, but they're here for as a resource. 
prescribed burners might ask a question, am I allowed to prescribe burn in areas for which the AQI forecast is code orange or higher? And it's a good question. It depends on the state and local agency policies or rules. In Florida and North Carolina, for example, we have policies that discourage prescribed burning during code orange and above days. Georgia, on the other hand, actually has a rule prohibiting prescribed burning on code orange and above days in certain areas. And I thought what we did here was pull together the number of days by, for each of the southeastern states for the last three years, the number of days where a PM25 um, was, there was a code orange or above forecast for PM25. And as you can see, there's not many. Um, so from a prescribed burning standpoint for PM25, if, um, you know, and even last year where there were no days above a forecast above code orange. However, for ozone, it's, it's different. There's, during the ozone season, um, there's a lot more days um, in recent years where we forecast, or the forecast has been for a code orange or, or higher. Uh, this slide shows the uh, combination of the number of days with the code orange or higher forecast by state. And uh, so it's just important for, I think, prescribed burners to understand that during, particularly during the summer months, um, it, to, to take and to consider the air quality forecast for the area in which they might uh, be planning to do conduct a prescribed burn. And then this next slide, so the question is, where do you get that information? And that's what this slide is, um, is I wanted to talk about that a little bit. For um, the primary two uh, resources for um, an air, getting air quality forecast information would be EPA's Air Now website or your state and local air quality agency uh, forecast uh, page. And the, there are some mobile apps out there. I believe Rick is going to mention the EPA Smoke Sense app in a little bit. Uh, but the, um, there are some private sector or private entities that have mobile apps uh, available as well. They're not always pulling the data from the forecast data uh, that state and local agencies report to air now, but uh, so just um, should be aware of that. And then uh, the air now website, um, this tab or the slide highlights the current AQI tab on the website. And the current AQI is based on monitoring data. So as a monitor records ozone or PM25 levels are reported to air now and then they compile that information as time goes on through the day and they have algorithms to try to project uh, what the um, AQI will be for that for a given area. And then um, the forecast, you can click on the forecast tab and see what the forecast is. And that's the forecasts are, are prepared by the state and local agencies and reported a, to API um, and then displayed on the AirNow website. At the top of the page, you can enter the zip code or you can select a state uh, to drill down uh, to get uh, more information about the area of concern. And in this, and these, we pulled all this information today off the AirNow website. So we selected North Carolina and to the right, you can see where the forecast, see the forecast for today, for tomorrow um, is uh, to, to pull the forecast information for North Carolina. I might add that we started county level forecasting um, earlier this year. And so we're showing the monitors on the right under the current AQI columns shows for counties that have monitors what the monitor reading is and color-coded uh, based on the AQI, based on that reading. And then you can also, through EnviroFlash, the EnviroFlash website, um, one can sign up for email notifications to receive a daily forecast, um, information on action days, where the NACs, the forecast is um, expecting an exceedance of the NACs or current conditions. And you can also set a minimum AQI level at which to receive emails notifications. And then the, the AirNow uh, website also has a fire information page, which it might be useful to some, uh, to, uh, and it has a layer selection shown here in the shot, screen, screenshot. The monitor locations are identified by circles on the map, and they're filled in based on uh, the AQI. And then the, um, there's little fire symbols that identify si satellite-derived fires, and, and then there's information also, there's a little orange symbol um, that pulls in information from the um, fire incident website 
uh, noted here. And then you can click on uh, these locations or circles to get more detailed information. And this last page is simply a resource slide for if you'd like to know where to find information on, on the AQI forecast for a given state. And then, or you can pick up the weather information from the weather, National Weather Service. And that's the end. Rick? There it is. You got it. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry about that, folks. Um, so, uh, so quickly, uh, some of the, there's a number of tools and resources out there that we just wanted to make you all aware of. And uh, some of them have already been alluded to from Jim's presentation and Randy's as well. But I'm going to cover some additional things. And one of the things that uh, we think is is important is this concept of basic smoke management practices and that's identified in a number of different locations including EPA's exceptional events rule which was kind of adopted into the rule from actually the um, the fact sheet at the bottom for, prepared by the US Forest Service and the NRCS um, the link there because that came out uh, many years before uh, the information was put in the exceptional events rule, but then there's also a fact sheet on the Southern Fire Exchange um, that also covers similar things. And they all talk about, they're not all identical, but they talk about similar things, which is essentially basic practices that can be followed to minimize the impacts of smoke, minimize the amount of smoke that's generated from a prescribed fire, and then minimize the impacts of that. And it, um, they talk about different um, tools like evaluating smoke dispersion conditions. And so there are models available that can do that. There are uh, weather parameters that should be considered. And then it goes into um, a whole gamut of other things like communicating with the public that's nearby that might be impacted and, and things of that nature. So um, th these are all good resources for y'all to um, check out and consider and along those lines um, a number of years ago uh, a group called Surpass that um, Jen Fawcett is going to mention in a in a few minutes and um, it, it's a it's a collaboration in the southeast and we partnered with the coalition of prescribed fire councils to develop this smoke management pocket guide which is essentially base, basic smoke management practices on a little pocket card and we produced um, over 25,000 of those and we've distributed those to burners across the southeast and the idea is to get it in folks hands so they can just have something to look at just like a little checklist to make sure they thought about these things before they actually uh, do burning. And then uh, taking that to the next level, the Surpass group um, converted that pocket guide into a, a mobile web app and that's displayed here. It's specifically formatted to show up well on mobile devices and it, it lists the same things that were on that card but it, um, you can the good thing here is you can click on each one and get a whole lot more information and it takes you to resources um, documents and even some um, smoke models that are available that can be used to evaluate where your smoke might go um, and it's good to consider all of that before before you actually burn uh, this next slide shows a link to the Southern Fire Exchange and um, it's an, their website is an excellent resource for all things fire um, and they have some great resources on uh, smoke and t models and tools and you can see on the list there the I'll, I'll talk about the blue sky framework in a minute I've got a couple slides on that the, the next couple are some models to that um, actually estimate the amount of smoke uh, uh, emissions that are um, generated by smoke, the amount of smoke that's generated from the fire and then the emissions in that. Uh, the high split model is something that Jim Boylan referred to and uh, those trajectories he showed, it actually has a more advanced 
mod, uh, dispersion model component that can be used as well if you have the information. Um, and then there's some uh, simple smoke screening tool and V-Smoke, and I've got a, the next slide shows um, some links there. And the simple smoke screening tool is, is really good just because you can go in and within a matter of minutes, if you um, enter some basic information about where your fire is and the type of fire that it is, you can get a visual output of, of where your smoke might impact sensitive receptors. So that I encourage folks to look at that. Um, and then V-Smoke is a little more advanced. It's a actual dispersion model that um, it takes more input information about your fire, but um, you can get a more detailed output that shows um, the, the estimated concentrations of smoke and actually it's it's designed to match up with those AQI color codes that Randy was just talking about a few minutes ago so that's a, a helpful model as well and it can be run right here online uh, on this uh, web link and then again going back to the Southern Fire Exchange they have a a whole wealth of information on documents, links to documents that go into a number of these uh, tools uh, and some research papers and studies that have been done. So I'd encourage everybody to check these out. They're um, definitely good resources. I mentioned a few minutes ago the, the blue sky model and that's a um, a more advanced modeling system um, that's been developed to uh, by the Forest Service to look at um, where smoke might go. And it was really developed for dealing with wildfires, but it can also be useful for prescribed fires. Um, the, the, this model is run twice daily uh, for the entire country and it uses satellite photo detects of fires and then it produces smoke plumes. It's kind of hard to see on here, but you can, this is an interactive website. You can zoom into your particular area where you have a fire and it'll give you an animation of where the projected smoke would go based on uh, weather models that are run twice daily. So it's very helpful, but then it also has what's called the blue sky playground, where if you have information about say a prescribed fire, you can enter that in there and uh, get some estimations of, of where your smoke might go. So that's a, um, a very powerful tool that's available online for looking at smoke impacts. Uh, I'll switch over to EPA has a number of um, web pages that have got some good tools as well. We have what we call the smoke ready toolbox for wildfires. Again, this is targeted for wildfires. Um, there's some good documents on human health impacts of smoke on this page, um, on, uh, links to the air now information that was ran, that Randy was talking about for air quality forecasting. And then there's a uh, separate page for um, dealing with specifically wildfire impacts on um, indoor air quality, which is something that is, is different as well. Um, and uh, one of the tools that's linked off of this page is called the EPA Smoke Sense mobile app. This is an application that's available on both Android and, and iPhones. And um, it uh, essentially you can, it's, it's very useful. You can, you can see on the right there, you can pull up the actual AQI forecast for your area for the, that day. And then it also shows satellite fire detects. And then uh, if there are satellite detected smoke plumes as well, like Jim was showing, that would show up on this page as well. So it's, it's real time, uh, very useful. But then the the other benefit of this and the reason it was developed is it's kind of a crowdsourcing thing because it asks folks um, when they look at this information, it asks if they're experiencing any symptoms uh, related to smoke exposure, like uh, are they having any breathing issues and that kind of thing. And then that, that information is collected to enable uh, researchers at EPA to, to evaluate um, how the, the relationship between smoke, uh, fire smoke and public exposure. Um, 
this page shows a CDC resource page that's got a, some similar information, but much, much more focused on health impacts of smoke. And this wildfire smoke guide for public health officials was um, a collaboration between EPA, CDC, and, and other agencies. Um, very uh, comprehensive document for looking at health impacts from smoke. And the last thing I'll show up here is kind of an emerging issue with, it's called EPA's Air Sensor Toolbox. And um, a number of relatively low cost sensors kind of shown down there in the bottom left are becoming available now where you can buy these things for a couple of hundred dollars and you can measure PM air quality. Uh, and th th there are a number of issues with that. It, they are helpful and they provide interesting information. The, the, the questions that you need to consider is how accurate is that information and how does it compare to actually the EPA's air, uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So this page provides lots of um, good tools to be able to evaluate, but I think that's an emerging thing. We. I was actually at the National Association of State Foresters meeting yesterday in Orlando, and this came up as an issue that's being seen more and more um, by states and um, the use of these low cost sensors. And then um, sometimes that can alarm folks um, when maybe there may not be as much of an alarm as, as what the sensor might tell you. So anyway, I just wanted to make folks aware of that. And so I will now hand it over to Jen for our last section. Thank you, Rick. All right, so I can hear you and your slides are up. Perfect. Okay, good afternoon. So to build on what Rick just shared and also to wrap up our presentation, I am going to leave you with some ways that you can take some next steps to learn more and receive more training and resources about on air quality. So um, there we go. So Rick kind of covered a lot of the fact sheets and webinars and tools available. I definitely recommend checking those out when you have a chance. Um, in addition to all of those great resources, I also wanted to make you aware of this training opportunity. So there is a course available called the Smoke Management and Air Quality for Land Managers, an online training resource. Uh, it was developed by the NWCG Smoke Committee and the University of Idaho. Um, it's intended to provide a core understanding of wildland fire smoke issues, and so the four modules that you see there will help introduce you to key smoke concepts, or if you already have an understanding, maybe provide a quick refresher before learning more complex or specialized skills. So it's available in two locations, depending on whether you need a certificate of completion or not. Um, if you don't, you can find it on the FRAMES website, but maybe for some of you that, that may need a certificate, certificate of completion for your, um, for your job or your personal reasons, then um, you can also go to the Wildland, Wildland Fire Learning Portal, and I have the links for both of those there um, where, you could, where you could take that course. In addition to the online training I just mentioned, that same portal on frame, so the emissions and smoke portal, also has a calendar of upcoming events on their page. Um, it contains a list of smoke-related upcoming webinars, conferences, and more. You can kind of click through it and see what's happening for the rest of the year um, related to smoke. There's a ton of really great things on there. Um, also on the Frames homepage is an interactive map of the wildland fire smoke contacts from across the country. So if you click on a state, it'll actually give you a list of the federal, state, tribal, local contacts for that state. Um, but recently, uh, for the states within EPA Region 4, actually this came out of um, some of our work. We um, we're able to pull together some of the smoke management program guidelines for the states in that region. And so a link to their smoke management program guidelines for those states that do have guidelines have actually been added to each state as a resource within that uh, smoke contacts section. And then also for any states that have any MOUs between state forestry and air quality agencies, those documents have also been added. So 
if your state's considering developing a smoke management program or an MOU, um, you could refer to these documents to see how other states have designed theirs. Or if your state already has one in place, this would be a great place to add yours, um, add, an, add it to this site for sharing with others. Next, as we all know, transportation safety and smoke is a very important issue. I just wanted to point out that last year, the NWCG Smoke Committee developed a 13-minute video called Smoke Roads and Safety Check Before They Wreck. Uh, you can find this on the NWCG, NWCG YouTube channel. This video provides best practices for predicting and managing smoke over roadways. Um, if any of you teach the RT300 Burn Boss Refresher course, this video is applicable to show during that class as well. Um, but it's also, it's helpful for anybody who does any sort of prescribed burning um, or works in wildland fire. Also stay tuned for a new guide that's about to be released by the NWCG Smoke Committee, um, a guide called Smoke Roadways and Safety Guide, which is supposed to be coming out fairly soon. It's designed for both wildfire and prescribed fire as well, so stay tuned for that. Next, for those of you who are really interested in smoke and air quality from wildfires and maybe want to gain some additional experience or put your knowledge to use, um, you might consider becoming what's called an air resource advisor. So this is a somewhat new technical specialist position available to incident management teams and agency administrators for wildfires, but um, anybody can train to become one regardless of your agencies. ARAs are basically trained to be dispatched to an incident um, to assist with understanding and predicting smoke impacts on the public and also for the fire personnel who are on the fire. So this person uses their air quality and smoke dispersion science to assess wildland fire smoke risks and impacts. And as we heard from Heidi earlier, wildfire smoke is a serious health and safety issue, especially out west, but also in the eastern U.S. during wildfires. So um, during those wildfire events when smoke's a concern, the use of an ARA is advised and they can be ordered pretty early on in the incident. So for any of you who want more information on ARAs or maybe how to become one, uh, you can visit the US Forest Service Wildland Fi Fire Air Quality Response Program website. Or um, what I have here is on the NWCG website. And you, so you would just look under the AD positions to learn more about that. Um, this year, it sounds like there probably won't be a new training class for new trainees, but there will be some classes available maybe next year. Um, or for those of you who are currently trainees, hopefully this year um, you might have some more opportunities than you did last year to get some hands-on experience. And finally, I just wanted to share with you some of the excellent progress and collaborations that has been taking place in EPA Region 4 that could potentially be used as a model for other regions. So as Scott mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, several years ago, a prescribed fire and air quality working group was formed between the EPA, the state forestry fire chiefs, and the state air quality directors and other regional partners um, to discuss prescribed fire smoke management issues and kind of exchange ideas on how to achieve prescribed fire and air quality goals. So I'm not going to go into too much history of this group, but I wanted to share that this group still to this day regularly meets and has even expanded over the years. Um, since 2013, the group has held what we're calling uh, smoke summits. So there have been four of those. Those have taken place biannually at the Jones Center in Georgia. And so this webinar that we're having today was actually one of the outcomes of those summits. Um, last year, the main objective of the summit was to identify regional prescribed fire and air quality coordination needs and solutions and to develop a set of goals and actions to guide our collaboration over the next two years. So during the summit, um, not only was information shared regarding national, regional, and state local activities and efforts related to smoke management, but one of the main focuses of the summit is to provide an opportunity for those state and local air quality agent re representatives to meet with the state forestry representatives and to meet face to face and discuss ways to collaborate on prescribed fire and air quality smoke management issues in their respective states. And always a key highlight um, of every summit, as you can see here in the pictures, is actually the opportunity for the, all of those participants to experience and participate in an educational prescribed burn. So this group, um, outside of the summits, we also have quarterly calls where the particip participants have the opportunity to talk about what's happening in their states. 
what challenges they're having, hear about any policy updates. Um, and then we encourage the state forestry and air to meet at least once a year before the fire season to discuss anything uh, prior to the fire season that might be specific to their state. So if you're interested in learning more about this working group or how we got started, or maybe you're thinking of creating one in your region, feel free to reach out to any of the, us on this webinar. Um, also in the Southern region, so it's been alluded to is the Surpass uh, Prescribed Fire Working Group. So that's with a partnership called the Southeast Partnership in Planning and Sustainability. Um, the Prescribed Fire Working Group, it's made up of representatives from local, state, federal agencies and NGOs kind of all across the Southern region. We work collaboratively to increase the use of prescribed burning across the South. Um, in 2013, we created a prescribed fire strategy that outlines several goals and lays out how to accomplish this. There's a, there's a list of action items that we work on together. Um, one of our goals is to minimize smoke impacts from prescribed fire and to encourage the collaboration between the fire and air quality community. So the prescribed fire and air quality working group has definitely been a big part of that. And then finally, uh, the Fire and Air Quality Working Group is collaborating with the North Carolina Prescribed Fire Council to put on a special session during the third International Smoke Symposium, which this year will be held in Raleigh, North Carolina and UC Davis, California in April. So I would encourage you to all attend this symposium if possible to gain additional training and learn more about wildland fire smoke. So uh, that's wraps up my portion and David, I'll pass it off to you to lead us into any q and It looks like we still have a little bit of time. All right, Jen, thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers today. So we have time in our program remaining uh, to answer and address uh, questions uh, of our speakers. So we have some folks who have already typed their questions into the the Q&A feature in Zoom. So if anybody else uh, would like to ask questions of our speakers, please go ahead and type your questions in and we will try and get to them. Uh, if you need to uh, leave or would like to reach out to and contact our speakers uh, offline, uh, their email addresses are all listed on the screen there. So what I'm gonna do is open up our Q&A here. All right, here's a question that came in uh, and someone asked, uh, what is the lower level for PM2.5 PM that's being considered? Hey Dave, uh, this is Scott and I'll let Jim Boylan uh, follow me, but the process we're in right now um, for new ozone standards and new PM2.5 standards is underway and the plan is to actually have the EPA administrator make a decision on this by the end of this calendar year. And um, Jim Boylan is, uh, as I mentioned previously, one of our very experienced and uh, experts, and he's actually participating in the process on the, the Clean Air uh, Advisory Committee for both of these standards. And so I'll let Jim um, just talk about what he can talk about right now as far as publicly um, available information. Yeah, hi, this is Jim Boylan. So yesterday, EPA rele released its final policy assessment, which is the, basically the document um, that is delivered to the EPA administrator with EPA's recommendation. Um, in, in this final policy assessment, um, the EPA, EPA recommendation is that the current um, standard is not adequate for the, um, for the annual standard. It, it is adequate for the 24-hour standard and the PM10 standard. So uh, what's uh, being, then what EPA had done was actually give um, a couple of options, you know, reasons for going um, as low as 10 micrograms per cubic meter and reasons why um, the administrator may consider going as low as eight micrograms per cubic meter. So I believe the answer to your question is the lowest level that's being considered is eight micrograms per cubic meter, um, but the administrator could go anywhere between um, 8 and 12, or the administrator um, could actually decide that the current standard is adequate uh, because the KSAC, um, the majority of the KSAC had actually recommended um, that the standard was adequate. So um, the, the EPA administrator is going to have to make a decision um, based on, on that information. All right. Thanks, Scott, and, and thanks, Jim. 
Um, here's a, another question that came in early in the webinar. Um, and this person asked, what is the difference between a non-attainment area and a maintenance area? Yeah, I'll, uh, and this is Scott again. I'll, I'll start out and then uh, if Rick wants to follow on, um, or Jim, or Randy. But uh, when EPA comes out with a standard, uh, there's a process to look at uh, the certified monitoring data for those areas and determine whether an area has been, is attaining that new standard. And so this process results in designations. And so when somebody um, is designated as non-attainment, then they're, um, the, the, the data and everything shows that they're not attaining that standard and they receive that designation from the administrator. Um, there's a process for an area to, that is non-attainment to be redesignated and that is attaining the standard. And once that happens, then the area actually has to show that they're gonna maintain the standard for a 20 year period. So that's when they become a maintenance area. So they're no longer a non-attainment area, but then they're a maintenance area and there are certain requirements that they follow um, as a maintenance area during that particular period. And the state will provide a maintenance plan that addresses all the requirements. All right, thanks Scott. Uh, here's another question that came in uh, asking about the low cost sensors. Um, I guess we can open this one up to anybody who wants to, to discuss it, but talking about the, the question specifically mentioned purple air and um, I guess refers to other options as well. You know, how are these uh, sensors and the information that they provide being used uh, by the public and others as well? Uh, this is Rick, I'll start. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely one of the most popular um, of these low cost sensors, the purple air monitors and as I mentioned in my talk those are you can buy one of these for around two hundred dollars um, it measures PM 2.5 concentrations and um, once you have that you can you can actually deploy these out on um, uh, in neighborhoods or wherever you want you can uh, there has been some efforts I understand to put them out in areas that are experiencing like wildfire smoke and um, the data gets uploaded automatically to the purple layer website and displayed on an interactive map and so it's available for everyone to see kind of instantaneously so as I mentioned um, there's definitely some cautions with these low-cost sensors the, they do uh, EPA has been doing research on these diff on all different types of the sensors, and they are finding that in many cases they can perform well and give you some good values. But um, in some cases, you need to actually to to be able to make them comparable to our air quality standards. You would would need to calibrate them, um, compare them with a uh, an actual federal res reference method to be able to um, make sure that the data that they're giving is um, comparable to the standards. Um, so um, anybody else can chime in as well if they have more to add. All right, Rick, thanks for, for jumping in there. Um, we had another question uh, that has come in uh, asking about a, uh, just a, a basic and user-friendly smoke management program or tool. I think that they're looking for a, perhaps a modeling tool. Um, you know, you covered some of those tools and resources, Rick. Uh, is there something that you think would be uh, the, the least intimidating to start working with or playing around with in terms of predicting where smoke might go from prescribed fire? Um, yeah, no, I can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear okay. you. Okay. Um, yeah, you were cutting in and out a little bit, but I think I got the gist of the question that looking for a user friendly tool. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. dispersion and I guess the first thing I would refer folks to is that um, V smoke 
uh, web version that was um, discussed in my presentation there that's linked off the Southern Fire Exchange. That That is a basic dispersion model that can give you that type of information. Actually, the Georgia Forestry Commission has their own version of the V-Smoke web that you can access from their web page that they encourage their burners to go and, and use to look at um, where their smoke might go before they uh, um, apply for a permit from Georgia. Um, but that um, that's, I guess, kind of as far as a middle of the road, um, the simple smoke screening tool that I mentioned earlier is, is really basic um, and very simple to use. But um, I think the V-Smoke would probably be a good place to start. So thank you all for joining us today. Thanks to our speakers and uh, have a great afternoon.